Brandon. It is a privilege uh, to be here with you today. Just thinking of this song that we sang at the beginning, that God is a miracle worker. Well, that's what we're going to learn about today and maybe a way that is different than you think about. That what is impossible with man is possible with God. We are going to see that so clearly. So thank you, Brandon. It's my first time preaching in your new space, and I'm really excited about that. We did actually our first Sunday back to uh, church in person was here with you at the bridge way back when. So it's a joy to be here together. A few years ago, I listened to a game show on NPR, um, and they played a game called The Sorrow and the Pity. It was based off of a catchphrase by Mr. T. You guys heard of Mr. T? I know that I may be dating myself a little bit, but a catchphrase by Mr. T uh, called, I pity the fool. The contestants were asked a question that could be answered with a word or a phrase that rhymed with the word fool. So let me give you an example of how it worked. If they were asked, do you feel bad? for the cylindrical piece of wood around which thread is wound, they would answer, I pity the spool. Another question was asked, do you sympathize with the concept that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you? To which the answer was, I pity the golden rule. I pity the golden rule. Interestingly, Mr. T once said, I believe in the golden rule. But then he went on to say in typical fashion for him, he with the most gold rules. Now, if you know Mr. T, you know he was decked out all the time in tons of gold chains. So he with the most gold rules. He believed that the more wealth and the more power the better, which is the prevailing belief within our world. Forget about God. Forget about doing to others as you would have them do for you and looking out for the interests of others. Instead, look out for your own interests. Look out for number one. His attitude is the polar opposite attitude of the attitude that we see in Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, we encounter that type of an attitude um, in our text this morning, and really you've encountered it throughout these last four weeks in the book of Daniel. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, as in the first three chapters of Daniel, we see that Nebuchadnezzar's attitude is really more like Mr. T than it is like Jesus. You've learned that this was the most powerful and the most wealthy man in all of the world, and he knew it, and he was proud of it. I mean, think about what you saw last week. What did he do? He put up a statue that was six stories high in honor of himself and of his gods. He knew that he was number one. He looked out for number one as well. But in Daniel 4, all of this changes. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Something changed in Nebuchadnezzar. He actually becomes a changed man. And the stage for this transformation is set in the first three verses of the chapter. Now, I failed to put slides or anything like that together, so you're going to need to just follow along in your own Bible. But before I read these first three verses of the chapter, I just want you to imagine for a moment that you are um, a ruler of some small province within the vast kingdom of Babylon, and you show up to your desk one morning, um, and you see your mail or your email, if it was the 21st century, and you see that in your inbox is a letter from King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in all of the world. And so what's the first letter that you're going to open? You're going to open the one from him. 
And as you open it and begin to read, this is what you read. This is what you read from the man that in the previous chapter had put up a golden statue of himself. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and the wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. And about that moment in the letter is when you spit out your coffee. And you wonder, is this fake news? Is somebody forging Nebuchadnezzar's signature on this letter that I have just received? How is it possible for a polytheist, somebody who believes in many gods, how is it possible for the most arrogant and the most powerful man in all of the world to write a letter like this, acknowledging that it is God most high whose kingdom is everlasting, and then even acknowledging that that God would have done something for him personally. How could this have happened? Well, thankfully, Nebuchadnezzar goes on in this letter for quite a lot of other verses to tell us exactly what happened. He actually shares his testimony with us, or gives us a little brief memoir, if you will, of what happened. How the mighty, the high and mighty man, Nebuchadnezzar, was brought low. The story that follows comes to us in three scenes. The first scene begins in verse 4 in the palace of the king. The second is on the roof, which begins in verse 28. And then the third scene is in the field in verse 34. And so as we trace this story along these three scenes, we're going to stop along the way to see some of the relevance and application for us today. So let's begin in the palace in verses 4 and 5, where Nebuchadnezzar introduces attention in his own recount of what has happened at the very beginning of the story. I want you to see this tension. This is what he says. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. Here is a man who is crushing it, so to speak, in his life. He is at the very top of his game. He has everything that anybody could ever want. In fact, he has everything that many of you, if you are honest, have been laboring for most of your life to get some measure of. Ease and prosperity. And he has it all. Power, fame, comfort, and pleasure. He is at ease in his house and he is prospering. That's verse 4. But notice what he says in verse 5. I saw a dream, and it made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So even King Nebuchadnezzar, at the height of his prosperity and his ease, he is faced with a personal crisis. This is the way that God often gets our attention, isn't it? When we're riding high, it's so hard for us to see our need for God. That's why in the passage I referenced earlier, when Jesus talks about the rich man, the disciples say, who then can enter the kingdom of God, right? It is hard when you are at ease and prospering to see your need for God when you're riding high. And so God in his mercy sometimes brings us down a notch or two so that we can look to him. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't look to God, at least not yet. What he does is what so many of us often do. He begins by looking to the wisdom of the world. He calls on the wise men of Babylon to help him understand his alarming dream. But as we've come to expect with these so-called wise men, they leave him wanting. They offer him 
no relief. But Daniel, Daniel shows up on the scene and everything changes. Daniel tells, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel the dream in verses 10 to 17. And I want to read all of these verses. Follow along in your Bible. Beginning in verse 10. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold. A tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches. And all flesh was fed from it. This is a marvelous picture. So far, so good. A picture of flourishing, of prosperity, and even of protection and care for what is likely referring to the kingdom of Babylon. But this part of the dream is not what kept Nebuchadnezzar up at night. That comes in the second thing that he sees. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher. So he saw a tree, now he sees a watcher, a holy one, who came down from heaven. And he proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip of its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him, notice how it changes from it, the tree, to him. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So now you can see why Nebuchadnezzar, or Neb, as we like to call him on our preaching team sometimes, how he is alarmed and having a really hard time sleeping. Jordan Green, one of the pastors at First Free, said, if there was ever a man who needed an Ambien, it was Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> he needs somebody to help him make sense of what's going on. And so he calls on Daniel, who has a proven track record for doing such things. And I want you to notice something here. There is clearly an opportunity here even though Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful and the wealthiest man in the world, he has everything that he could possibly need. He is still at this point in need. And even the best and the brightest in all of his kingdom, which he has command of, has no answers for him. Very similar situation that we see in our world. And so Daniel has a golden opportunity to speak the truth to the most powerful man in the world. And what will he do with that opportunity? Well, his response is marked by three characteristics. Three characteristics that are quite instructive for us. I don't want you to feel that this is the main point of this passage, but at the same time, I would hate to miss the opportunity for you to glean a little bit from Daniel's example of the way that he addresses King Nebuchadnezzar here. Three things. First, he is compassionate. He wants the best for Nebuchadnezzar, the man that took him from his home and hauled him off into exile, and now has consigned him to service within his kingdom. Daniel wants the best for that man. And so we read in verse 19 that he was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. Isn't that the definition of compassion? 
Remember where we find Nebuchadnezzar? He's alarmed by his dream. But now, Daniel too is alarmed. But it's not because he doesn't understand what the dream means. It's because he actually does understand what the dream means. He knows that Nebuchadnezzar is that prosperous tree, but he knows also that as someone on our preaching team said this week, the divine lumberjack is about to cut him down. But Daniel, unlike so many of us, doesn't take delight. He doesn't get a kick out of the fact that the mighty are about to fall, that the arrogant are about to be brought down. Instead, his heart is for Nebuchadnezzar. And so in his alarm, he says to the king, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and your interpretation for your enemies. He knows that it's not for them, but he wishes that it were. But second, Daniel is candid. Just because he's compassionate, get this, it doesn't mean that he shrinks back from telling it like it is. He still speaks the truth. And listen to his candid words in verses 22 to 25. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heaven, your dominion to the ends of the earth. And skip down to verse 24. It is a decree, the second part of the vision, of the Most High. This repeated way of referring to God throughout this passage. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Can you? I don't think this dream's that tricky to understand. I wonder if the wise men of Babylon actually didn't have a hard time understanding what it means. They just didn't want to say it. But Daniel, this young man, has the courage to be candid and speak the truth to the most powerful man in all of the world. Third, he gives counsel and calls for repentance. He doesn't announce it, uh, he doesn't stop at announcing God's coming judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar. He goes on to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he can do in response to the announcement of this coming judgment. He calls the king to change. And then he reiterates his heart for the king. Look at verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Do you see his heart again? The whole thing is bracketed by his heart for this man. So that's the dream and its interpretation. We are left as readers wondering what will happen next. Will the dream come to pass? Will Nebuchadnezzar take Daniel's counsel and repent? Let's turn to the next scene to see. In verse 28, we are told, The suspense is let out quickly. The dream did come to pass. But then in verse 29, we're told how it came to pass. And here we find Nebuchadnezzar no longer just in his palace. He's moved up onto his roof. And I think it's so important for you to understand or to imagine, if you will, the scenery for a minute, to get the picture of what's going on in the historical context. The roof of his palace would most likely have been the tallest place in the grandest city in the world at that time. Here, Nebuchadnezzar could look out over the most beautiful as well as unarguably 
the strongest city in the world. Keep in mind that where he is at this moment is the home of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Those of you in school ever learned about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? They're one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay, so just so you know how amazing they are, the pyramids in Egypt, they made it on that list. So that gives you an idea of just how amazing the Hanging Gardens would have been. A maze of beautiful and terraced flowers, shrubs, even waterfalls. In fact, they were designed for Nebuchadnezzar's wife who came from another part of the world that was used to mountainous terrain and he had moved her to Kansas on the plain and he wanted her to have some type of experience of what it was like in her home country. That's why he did this. But it's not only the most beautiful city in all of the world, it is also the most powerful. There are massive walls to protect the city, walls so broad that a team of chariots could ride across the top of them and even turn around as they got to the end of one of the walls. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar think of the city? He tells us in verse 30, and his words make it clear that he doesn't get the point of this dream or the interpretation. His words reveal the main problem that this text addresses. He says this, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? He's been called to repent. He's been given a dream. He's been given an interpretation. He clearly still doesn't get it. Think about this for a moment. The purpose and the dream up to this point have already been given to Nebuchadnezzar twice. First, out of the mouth of the watcher in verse 17. He says that all that's about to happen to him is to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. But then Daniel, in the interpretation, told him the same thing in verse 25. He says, until you come to know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. He didn't listen to the watcher. He didn't listen to Daniel, and so now God himself makes the point. In verses 31 to 32, it says, While the words were still in the king's mouth, look at all that I have done. He's still speaking. There fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. This is the main point of the passage. This is what you need to go home knowing. This is what needs to be put in your pocket. This is what needs to be underlined in your Bible. This is what needs to be put in your heart. God is most high. Higher than Nebuchadnezzar standing on the roof of the, of the highest place in the most prominent city in the world. God is most high. God rules the kingdom of men, not Nebuchadnezzar. And the only reason that Nebuchadnezzar is even sitting in that place and has all of the wealth and power that he has is because God willed it and God made it happen. But Nebuchadnezzar clearly doesn't get this. He thinks that the strength of his kingdom is the result of pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. And he thinks that the glory and the beauty of this kingdom all reflects actually his glory. So high and so mighty. His pride is so blatant, so extreme. So extreme 
that many of us may miss just how relevant it is for us. You see, we share a lot in common with Nebuchadnezzar. Even though none of us ever has, nor ever will, let's just be honest, you're never going to make it to the level that Nebuchadnezzar made it. No matter how hard you keep climbing, you ain't never going to make it there. And yet, so much in common. We have drank the Kool-Aid that our culture has been putting out before us for two, three hundred years to value maybe above all else the self-made man, the self-made woman. We are called to pursue the American dream and when we receive any level of success in our lives, even something really small, we want to do a touchdown dance. We want to post highlights on Instagram so that people will like it over and over again. We stand on the roof of our house and we say, look what I have done. Whether it's getting a B in class or making second string of the football team, we say, look how great I am. When we get promotions at work, we believe that we made it to that next rung in the ladder because of our will, because of our hard work, because of our intelligence. When we have a good idea and we hear somebody else talking about it, what do we want? Credit immediately. But you see, this is a distorted view of reality. It's an inaccurate picture of the way things really are. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was only strong and only glorious because God gave it to him, and the same is true for us. Let's just be honest for a moment. Did any of you ever have the choice to be born into this country as opposed to being born in Niger, for example, which is one of the poorest countries in the world? Did you have any control over that? Did you have any control over the family that you were born in? Do you have any control over the brains that have been put in your head? Really, you have very limited control even over the opportunities that have been placed before you. All of the privilege that we have has been given to us by God and therefore should be used for the glory of God. Now, don't get me wrong. There is nothing inherently wrong with being the leader of the most powerful country in the world. Now, there may be some things that were done wrong to get to that spot, but there is nothing inherently wrong with being the leader of the most powerful country in the world. There's nothing wrong with being the CEO of the biggest company in the world. There is nothing wrong with having a good education or having money. There is nothing wrong with being an American. There is nothing wrong with whatever color of skin that you have been given. But do you see that all of it, all of it, is due to the sovereign will of God. And if you do, it will make you humble, not proud. And it will affect what you do with what you have. As Brandon has said to me as we've talked about race, there is nothing wrong with privilege. Do you believe that? There is nothing wrong with privilege but you must steward your privilege. Nebuchadnezzar clearly didn't see it this way. Instead of humbling himself and giving praise to God, he took credit. Instead of stewarding his privilege to do good for other people, he hoarded his privilege and took advantage of other people. He was unjust. He was merciless. He was cruel. Why do you think that Daniel tells him in verse 27, 
Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. He's indicting him. He's basically saying, you've been given all of this and look what you've done with it. You haven't stewarded your privileges. You see, when you treat others well, it shows that you are grateful for the blessings that you've been given. We've seen that Nebuchadnezzar was given an opportunity to repent when he had a personal crisis, but he persisted in his sin. And so what happens next in verse 33 is really no surprise. Immediately, the word that God spoke was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, which he's getting, he's getting rained on, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Would have driven my wife crazy. She's all about keeping your nails trimmed. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. He's no longer on the roof, is he? The man has hit rock bottom. And so our final scene is in the field where Nebuchadnezzar is eating grass. In these seven periods of time, whatever they were, seven months, seven seasons, seven years, whatever they were, they have passed. And so what will he do now? The only thing that he can do when a person has reached as low as he has reached, he looks up. Look at verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. It's clear that Nebuchadnezzar has been humbled by God, but just because a person is humbled doesn't mean that they're humble. I want you to get the difference today. Humility has to do with the way we look at ourselves, not just what has happened to us. You see, you can be at the bottom and still be as arrogant as can be. And you can be at the top of the pile and actually still be Humble, And I want you to see that the key to humility, first and foremost, is the way that we see ourselves in relationship to God. Yeah. The way that we see ourselves in relationship to God. And that is our first indication that something has changed in Nebuchadnezzar. How, how is it possible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? What is impossible with man is possible with God, and we see the transformation when he's at the bottom. He praises God. While he's still in the field, look at what he says at the last part of verse 34. Blessed be the Most High. He gets God's name now. God is Most High. And praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Remember in chapter 3, he wanted his kingdom to endure forever, and the people came to him and they said, O king, may you live forever. Now he acknowledges that it is God who lives forever and that his kingdom endures. All other kingdoms will come down. Only God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Earlier in this chapter, he thought that all that he had accomplished had been because of the exertion of his will. Now in verse 35, he sees that everything that happens in life is because of God's will. But I want you to get this. He not, a lot of people will, will pray to God when they're at rock bottom. A lot of people will praise God whenever they get some breadcrumbs, when they're at the bottom. But then what happens when they're restored? So 9-11 hits, and we see a response. But then what happens when equilibrium comes back? COVID hits. People respond, but then what happens? We see Nebuchadnezzar restored to an even higher spot than he was before in verses 36 to 37, 
but he still is praising God. This is what it says. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all of his works are right, and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I want you to get this. This passage is not mainly about humility. Humility is an implication. This passage is mainly about God. And when we see that God is high, it will affect the way that we see ourselves. The key to Nebuchadnezzar's humility was he came to see God in the right way. The goal of the dream and of the interpretation and the fulfillment of the dream was accomplished. Let me just draw your eyes back again to verse 17, the purpose of this all. To the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Goal accomplished. Nebuchadnezzar came to know this truth. But did you notice something in that verse? The goal of coming to see God as the ruler of all things was not just for Nebuchadnezzar. What does it say? The goal was for the living to know. Remember who Nebuchadnezzar wrote his letter to at the beginning of this passage, to all of the people's nations and languages that dwell on the earth. Nebuchadnezzar, get this, tells them what has happened to him by way of personal testimony, but for the goal that the same thing would happen to them as a result of his testimony. So we've seen what it took For God to transform Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world, to come to see that he was the king of heaven. But now, it's on you. What will it take for you to come to see the same truth? Are you living life on your high horse? You need to know that God rules over all. He rules over every nation, even this nation. But get this. He even rules over the little nation that you have set up in your heart that declares, I am king. I am most high. And every kingdom that comes against him will not stand. Tell them that God is going to cut you down. That's what Johnny Cash says. Your kingdom, God the Most High, he will have no rivals in his kingdom. You either bow the knee now or you will bow later. But every knee will bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue confess that Christ is Lord. So either now or later. Maybe you're not on your high horse. Maybe you're living in the dumps right now. Has a personal crisis taken you out at the knees? Has what we're experiencing in our country right now brought you down low? Don't waste your low point, so to speak. Maybe God is trying to humble you. Maybe God wants you to see your sin and your pride, and that's why he's brought you down. That's why he's brought you low. But if that's where you find yourself, you need to know this. God not only will and wants to bring you low, he also wants to lift you up. And part of his kindness involves exposing our sin. You see, we don't always see ourselves rightly. Sometimes we just think that we're so great, so strong, and so wise, and we don't see that in relationship to the Most High God, we are actually weak and foolish. We think that we're ruling some little fiefdom in our hearts, and yet we fail to see that we have rebelled against the King of the universe, and we're in trouble if we do not surrender and throw down our arms. 
And so God brings us low so that we can see ourselves more clearly, but he brings us down so that we will lift up our eyes and look to him. In fact, God is so committed to lifting you up that he brought himself down. He cares so much for you that he humbled himself. Jesus Christ, friends, is God. He is the son of God. He is the king of heaven. He is the ruler over all. And yet, the king of heaven didn't stay in heaven. He took on flesh and he became a man. And then he did the unthinkable. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. And then after that, after the crucifixion, God raised him up and has exalted him to the highest place, seated at the right hand of God the Father, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. And he's coming again. And those who have not bowed the knee to him now, between his first coming and his second coming, he will cut them down. But here's the good news for you. Do you want to be lifted up today? How do you do it? Lift your eyes to Jesus. Turn from your sins and your iniquities. Trust in his substitutionary, all-sufficient, perfect sacrifice on the cross for you and receive forgiveness for your sins. But not only that, Get excited for what's coming. When he returns, you won't face judgment. No, instead, the king of heaven who reigns over all of the earth, we are told that we too will be raised with him. We will reign with him and we will share in his perfect glory for all eternity. Amen? Turn to him. If you have been brought low, not just in your circumstances, but maybe the Spirit of God has brought you low in your hearts this morning. That is the perfect place to be if you are going to lift your eyes up. But what about those of you who have already placed your trust in Christ? For you, I'd like to encourage you to take just two simple but profound cues from Nebuchadnezzar, a man whom in God's providence has delighted for him to write a chapter in our Bible. A couple of cues from him. First of all, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. When you start to see more clearly that all that you have is not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done for you, supremely in Christ, the only proper response is to give glory and praise To God. Offer your lives as living sacrifices in view of his mercy. But not only that, take it a step further and share with the world what God has done for you like Nebuchadnezzar did so that others would come to know that God is most high. Not them, not this country, but that God is the most high. But not only that, but that that same God delights to lift us up. Share that good news. Publish it abroad. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that Christ humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that he could lift us up. We look forward to the day when he will come and put this world to its rights, do away with all injustice, all oppression, and we place our confidence in his kingdom. But I pray that first and foremost, that you would help everybody here to make sure they have done personal business with the king of heaven today. That you would draw them in humble surrender to faith in Christ. And then that we would live with lips and with lives, lives of worship and praise to you. We pray all of this in the strong and hopeful name of Jesus. 
Amen.